From mystery to romance and science fiction, from heartfelt essays to poetry that moves the soul. Fresh Starts is a bold new anthology of tales from the Pikes Peak writers. I recently had a chance to interview three of the contributors, Joshua Clark, Bowen Gillings, and Terry O'Dell, about this collaborative project put together by Pikes Peak writers. A little bit of behind the scenes, behind the stories, as well as some tips for writers. And that's coming up in this episode. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 186 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. This is a between episode. It's uh, a new episode I'm inserting. Uh, well, actually, I'm inserting episode 186 between episodes 185 and 187. I know that's strange that those numbers don't sequentially work, but this is an extra episode on top of my weekly uh, podcasts. And this is because on Friday, April 9th, I had the opportunity to do a live celebration of a book launch chatting with three of the contributors from the Pikes Peak Writers um, Anthology, which is called Fresh Starts. So many great stories in there. I haven't yet read it. I, I did purchase it on Kobo and I'm so excited. I'm getting a paperback copy sent to me. I can't wait to get that signed uh, because I do know several of the writers in it and I know they're amazing uh, writers and I can't wait to read it. But this was just a celebration and a little bit of the behind the scenes and sort of, sort of the inspiration uh, for each of these author stories. And I, I've long been a purveyor of writers, uh, you know, being wide and publishing in many, many different formats. So short stories is one of them. And I love the way that this writers group put this anthology together. I, of course, think about ways that anthologies can be done collaboratively. You can use different payment splitting opportunities like draft to digital payment splitting, which I've done on anthologies. But this is um, something I thought would be useful to share with writers because Hearing and seeing what other writers are up to, the different um, s struggles they have with, you know, writing. Uh, I think Terry O'Dell gets into, she normally doesn't write short fiction. <laughs> you know, her first book was 140,000 words and, and an agent told her to uh, cut it down. Um, and, and it's just, I think it's intriguing. Uh, I think uh, Bowen talks a little bit about being a, a young father or having a young child and, and how that's changed Um his ability to write. So as always, there's always something really cool to learn from listening to other writers. And so I'm just going to do a quick ad read for this episode's sponsor, Find Away Voices, and then we'll get right on to the audio from this interview that I did. And there'll be a link to the video of uh, the three of us chatting in the show notes over at starkreflections.ca. But let's get to the ad read and right into the interview. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a platform that allows you to get your audiobook out into the global audiobook market of more than 40 retail and library platforms. With Findaway Voices, you can control the price everywhere except, well, you know, Audible because they won't let anyone control the price. They just want to be in control there. But you do have price control, which is exciting because using Findaway Voices, you can submit to become uh, part of different promos, uh, price promos through Apple, as well as through Chirp. They are partnered with Chirp, uh, which is owned by BookBub, which is a great place for writers to promote their eBooks, but also Chirp is a fantastic place to promote their audiobooks, and you can't get into Chirp unless you're in Findaway. Now, if you're looking for a professional narrator to work with, you can also use Findaway Voices for the creation of your audiobook. What I love about Findaway is you have choice, you have control. It's all back in your hands. Yes, you can find a way to be back in control with Findaway Voices. And if you're looking for ways to find ways to find a way to be in control, that was a bit of a tongue twister. How long have you uh, have you been a listener for a long, long time? Do you remember? When I used to do tongue twisters in the Find Away Voices ad read, does anyone uh, want me to try that again? Uh, I, I did have a, a few people comment saying, no, never, please stop it. So I, I did stop it, but I never had anyone come back and say, yeah, Mark, love those tongue twisters. 
but but if you're thinking that, like, hey, I can do a special little one for you. Anyways, uh, okay, back to the ad read. Yes, if you're looking for ways to find a way to take control of your audiobook, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. After the fires are out, the smoke is cleared, the divorce is over, the widow has stopped wearing black, the sun has risen, the monsters are dead, the world is saved or destroyed, the storm has calmed, and the trouble is over. What do you do next? Find out in the first anthology of work by the Pikes Peak writers. From mystery to romance and science fiction. From heartfelt essays to poetry that moves the soul. We can't promise only happy endings. Just that moment when you pick yourself up out of the wreckage and find the strength to begin anew. Well, hello, and welcome to the celebration of the Fresh Starts Anthology. My name is Mark Leslie Lefebvre, and I am thrilled to have with me three of the dynamic contributors to this new, exciting anthology from Pikes Peak Writers. Bowen, Terry, Josh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I am uh, so thrilled to talk about this. So today, uh, as we're doing this live recording, it's uh, it's Friday, April 9th, and today is release day. Congratulations, guys. Thank you. Thank you again. Very happy. (laughs) Yes. I want to. Yeah. And and I know it's, I want to get some of the background stories. So I'm going to be talking to each of you about the stories, uh, some of the background behind the stories. But I first want to talk about. So uh, talk about a little bit about the group, about Pike Peak Writers, uh, what it is, uh, and then and then we can kind of segue into the anthology itself. I'll answer that if, if that's okay. I mean, that's great. Yeah, uh, thank you. I used to be on the on the board, so I have a little bit of knowledge about it. Um, Pike Peak Writers is a is a nonprofit organization that's pretty much committed to the education and promotion of writers, uh, not just our local area writers, but we're always happy to do so. Um, It's been around for about 28 years, um, and it actually started with our conference and then became an organization after the first conference we did, and it's been highly successful. Um, Our membership is in the thousands. Uh, Members are from all over the country. Uh, We do free events uh, four times a month for for writers, and we also do uh, bigger events throughout the year that are like either half day or full day kind of things, and we do an annual conference that's coming up here. Uh, This year it will be virtual. Uh, but it's coming up this this month, actually, the uh, 23rd to 25th of April. Oh, cool. So, I, I mean, I have actually had the honor of, of being at one of the, the Pikes Peak in-person events in your gorgeous location, which is near a mountain. I can't remember the name of it. But um, <laughs> but uh, but so so it's virtual this year. Does that mean uh, can people – is there still an opportunity for people to register? Are they still able to get in there and check it out? Yes, they can. Absolutely. Yep, they can go to – um, just go to pikespeakwriters.com. There's a conference link. They can go in there. They can sign up. We're still having similar format to normal. There's workshops. They can still pitch to editors and agents. They are There are keynotes giving presentations. Uh, this year, it's uh, Mary Robinette Kowal. It's uh, Revis Wortham. And it's Laura DiSaverio, who is actually a Colorado uh, author. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. So, uh, Bowen, before this started, we were talking a little bit about the origin of the anthology. Uh, can you get into like what's the what was the reasoning behind wanting to put this together, and how did it all happen? Uh, it had been kind of a dream of the organization for a, a while, and uh, it, it just it, it took somebody to actually raise their hand because we're a fully volunteer based organization. It, it, Pikes Peak Writers is. Somebody had to raise their hand and commit to doing it. And Kathy Scrimger is the one who did that. And um, we actually had a uh, 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 a little meeting, a briefing of some people who had done uh, 
uh, anthologies in the past, had edited them, put them together. And in fact, um, uh, one of them was up there who helped out, helped the Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers do theirs. Anyway, they, they gave us a nice presentation on this is what it takes to do it. And Kathy was not dissuaded. She still uh, decided uh, she will take the reins. And for the last almost three years, uh, she got a team together, an editorial team. They, you know, farmed out getting submissions. They did all the work and they created this amazing inaugural anthology that we're part of. Excellent. Excellent. So you mentioned something about they have members from all over the place, a thousand members. And so when I first saw this, I thought, oh, you, so you have to be uh, either a member of the group or you have to live locally to, to have participated. Was that the case? No, not at all. Um, uh, as we were talking about before we got on live, uh, there was people from all across the country that submitted. I think we even had some from outside of the country submit. So yeah, it was, I think um, it was well over like 200, I'd say 233 submissions. It was, a, it was a large number of submissions that came into this, our first anthology that they had to whittle down to what you see in the book now. Very, very cool. So there is a comment, uh, comment from uh, Dennis who says, nice cover, Josh, which is, <laughs> the perfect segue Thanks, because uh, <laughs> I'm going to pop the cover up on the screen. I know we saw it in the opening intro, but I'm just going to pop it up really quickly as it should appear kind of between us. Uh, where's it? Where's the cover? If only I knew how to use this technology. There it is. Let's pop the cover up so we can have a quick look at the cover. So uh, Josh isn't uh, just a, a writer uh, to the anthology, but also put the cover together. It is quite gorgeous. Can you talk a little bit about the inspiration for this cover? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I had been talking with Kathy um, about, I guess, yeah, the, the cover and the editorial team. And so they gave me a lot of creative freedom. Um, they provided me with the blurb that um, was shown in the video at the beginning. Um, so really, I just worked with that and um, worked up a couple roughs for them to take a look at. Um, I, and I had one that was a little more based with the mountains um, and then kind of loose concept of what we ended with. And then um, at another one with, um, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, rocket and kind of a little space frontier with that one um so yeah for this one i kind of was drawn to the idea with um a bridge and since that's something you always use to cross an obstacle or gets you around an obstacle you otherwise could not um safely get to the other side, I thought that um, played in well with this idea of fresh starts and beginning anew and kind of that potential for new possibilities kind of was my driving factor with this design. Cool. Well, it is very effective. And it's funny, I didn't even, I hadn't even thought about the bridge aspect, but that makes complete sense when you, when you think about it. So, um, Terry, um, I know this. Uh, we were talking earlier about the story that you submitted, and um, it the story was not a fresh new story you had just written, but it actually no. has a bit of legacy or a little bit of history. Although it did it did sync up with what they were looking for, didn't it? Can yeah. you talk about that? Right. I actually, after we talked previously, went back and looked. I wrote that story in two thousand two. Okay. I belong to an online group, uh, long since defunct. I mean, CompuServe doesn't exist anymore, any of that. Uh, I had no desire to be a writer. I was just playing. It was just fun. And every week they had this little prompt called Open the Envelope. And I went into, into that full, and it, it would be anything. It would be uh, write something using these five words and you'd have to work out a short story. Uh, okay. So I I can't remember the prompt for the life of me. I don't know <laughs> what led to, to this one, but it, there must have been something. And uh, 
it's more women's fiction than I write. And uh, I think I entered it in a local, I lived in Florida then in a local contest and it didn't do all that well. But, you know, word to writers, don't throw anything away. Because you never know <laughs> what's 2020 minus 12, 2002, 18 years later. Wow. I saw the, um, the call for stories and I'm not good at writing to a, a theme. I, I, ha- I found my niche and I, that's where I want to live. Mysteries and romantic suspense. But I looked and I said, hmm, this was about a woman who had been divorced uh, fairly recently, lived in New York City, big city girl. She moves to a small town in Colorado and she's making all the adjustments and gets together with the group of women reluctantly. Uh, and they, they bring her out of her shell. And it, it was just a kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, so I looked at it and I said, well, I have this story and she's got a fresh start in life and it fits the, you know, the blurb, although they didn't have the blurb then. Uh, so I, I took it out and polished it. Let's, you know, I, I will admit that what I wrote in 2002 isn't as good as what I can write now. Uh, it didn't need a whole lot though. It's kind of scary. <laughs> I submitted it and it was one of those, um, you know, if it goes, it goes. And if not, it didn't cost me anything. Wow. It made the first cut and I go, whoa. And then <laughs> it was accepted. I go, okay, maybe I should have more confidence in my ability to put words into sentences and the paragraphs and the stories. Even 18 years ago. 18 years <laughs> Before ago. you had all of that experience under your belt with the different series. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it was... I mean, everything was learning. I, I was having fun because I, I had not wanted to be a writer from the time I was four. I had an AARP card before I even started thinking about writing. So it was just like no more room for needlepoint. Might as well start writing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I love, uh, and, you, and you did say this when you were talking about writers, is never throw anything away because this story from 18 years earlier was given a fresh start, was given an opportunity to, to be out there uh, in this fantastic anthology. That is a great lesson for writers as well. Thank you for sharing that. My pleasure. So there is a comment, uh, another comment I'm gonna pop up and it's uh, from the uh, PPW <laughs> anthology. Uh, so, uh, we had 255 submissions and submitters were from across the US along with India and Germany. So um, very global. Uh, in that, because you know, from the top of Pike's Peak, you can almost see the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <It's in> Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Bowen, uh, t- tell tell us your story. Uh, what what is the story, and then we'll want to dig into maybe some of the behind the behind the story and what the inspiration might have been. Um, I would say a similar, or at least a parallel, kind of beginning to what Terry was saying. It was um, one of those that I just started writing and, and, and let, let's see where this idea goes kind of thing. Um, and it, just, it kind of evolved into, well, what if instead of two adventurers at the peak of their career, where maybe it's two adventurers who are in the swan song of their career and are trying their hardest to get out of their life. Uh, they don't want to be fighting and saving the world anymore and they're tired of it and they want to retire to the coast, but they keep getting pulled back in. And um, the more I wrote it, the more I enjoyed it. And to the point where I, it's the basis now of a series of short stories that I'm writing. That's these same guys who are constantly remembering the good old days as they're constantly doing stuff. So that's, that's kind of where it came from. And I wanted to also try my hand at bringing uh, a more humorous voice into the kind of classic uh, sword and sorcery vein that's usually got a lot of darkness, at least on the outside, pushing in on your main characters. Um, but you usually have a central friendship. Uh, if you look at um, like Fritz Lieber's Fafford and the Grey Mouse or those guys that, they, that come together, um, or even Scott Lynch's Gentleman Bastard's characters, and that's kind of where it came from. And then I am... I tend to write with a pretty snarky attitude for all my characters anyway. So I wanted to bring that in, which is something I've written in like historic or um, humorous suspense previously. I'm like, I'm going to try this in a more fantasy vein because I also enjoy reading fantasy. And that's where this story kind of came out of this. Let's see where this goes and 
I guess it worked because I my story got selected for the anthology. So just to clarify, th these characters were characters you were already writing about, or was the story for this anthology the first time you had written about them? This is the very first. This is the first time I, I wrote about them. I oh, wow. I envisioned a scene and started writing that scene, and that grew into what the, the, the story became. The characters got fleshed out. I liked playing with them. I went back and started them again and 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 did some more things uh, with them. But yeah, the, this, uh, this story came about not specifically for the anthology, but I it just happened to parallel that exact time frame that when I was getting it done is when the submissions came open. And I was like, well, this kind of fits. So I'm <laughs> wow. gonna see, see what happens. It was kind of a serendipitous parallel line that was going on there. Oh, that's that's phenomenal. Uh, so a fresh story you had just worked that uh, written that would fit. And then Terry had a story that she had written earlier in her writing career that uh, fit too. Mm -hmm. So now we have to get the tiebreaker. Josh, uh, let's talk about your story. Was it was it a previous story? Was it a new one you just wrote? What's the what, what's the scoop on your story? Sure. Um, so mine was also a previous story. It was not as many years before as Terry's was. I had. I think you're old enough. <laughs> uh, so I had written it just a few months before, actually. Um, um, yeah, so just had, I guess, was feeling very nostalgic that day because I um, got this idea to, that I really wanted to write about a snow day and just all the things you could do um, during a snow day. And um, so a little bit about what the story is about. My protagonist, Nolan, had never lived anywhere that got a significant amount of snow. So he had this list made up of what he wanted to do when he got a snow day. Um, so that day finally came around. And of course, there's things that get in the way that the day doesn't quite work out how he'd like it to. But he needs to figure out how to make the best of that anyway. Um, but yeah, so that kind of was just my concept I was working with and um, kind of just write very organically. I just <clears throat> like a small premise and then um, I usually look for either a um, friendship duo or um, sibling stories, which this has both of those aspects. And um, then I just kind of start and write and let the dialogue flow and um, really revolve around those characters and see what comes out of that. And um, oh, yeah, I had a ton of fun with this one. And um, in the anthology uh, submission call came out, thought this could work pretty well just with the um, I know with snow, you always have that fresh new possibility. And um, in this case, for my character, there this was a whole new experience and something he'd never got to do before. And uh, I'd submit it and was very pleased to see it got accepted. Well, congratulations. I have to ask... Um... The difference for you in creating in words or creating in images, uh, do you approach them similarly or differently? Yeah, it, yes, ironically, or at least I sort of found it a little ironic. It is rather similar for me. Um, I had forgot to mention that with the cover. I have a very organic process with um, my digital art or graphic design work as well. Um, kind of just will look at some different images to use or um, it's kind of really similar with the writing that I'm just looking for pieces to play with and we'll see what will work. And sometimes that requires a lot of revision on for both of those mediums, but um, that kind of really excites me and 
is what makes the process for both of those things really exciting. Cool. Thank you so much. I'm going to pop up another uh, another comment from the, our good friends, PPW Anthology. <laughs> this is an important lesson I think we all need to attend to. Uh, also, don't give up on your dreams. One of our accepted authors is published for the first time at 78 years young. Congratulations. Do we know who this 78-year uh, young person is? They know who they are. Congratulations. <laughs> Don't give up on your dreams. Um, so speaking of dreams, so uh, I know uh, Terry. I've read uh, some of her novels. I know she's a novelist as well, but uh, short fiction as well. Josh is an artist as well as a, a short story writer. Uh, um, do you guys write long uh, books? Uh, do you write short fiction? Do you write other things? I really have trouble writing short. I don't, you know, it's too hard. I need that 80 to 100,000 words to to get it done. I think the first book I wrote um, when I finished the draft, and this was the first thing I'd ever written, um, was 140,000 words. Whoa, but your novels aren't that long. No. They, they, the editor I spoke with at a conference said, uh, Nobody is going to look at a new first-time author at 140,000 words. Wow. If I go to the bookstore, I want the fattest book I can find because it's more words for my back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It'll keep me occupied longer. But, no, I, I've shortened, got them shortened down. But the book started with one of these open-the-envelope prompts. It said, write a 200-word hook. And I wrote something down and... and uh, the comments were, oh, what happens next? And I go, I don't know, because you just told me to write 200 words. <laughs> okay. Involved into that 140,000 word first draft novel. <laughs> don't ask Terry to write a 200 word book. She's going to write a 140, <laughs> okay, 140 I, I, pound I, I novel. Did, I did the 200. It just, when they asked me what happened next, I, I had to write it to find out. <laughs> Uh, Bowen, is it short fiction? Is it long fiction? What do you normally uh, land on? Uh, I started committed to I'm writing novels, and that's what I'm going to do. And my first novel manuscript, I kept getting stuck and restarting for like a year. And then uh, I went to an improv writing session, improvisational writing session hosted by a, a friend of mine. And that, that writing prompt turned into a short story that short story got published that short story then became chapter the opening chapter of my actually completed novel manuscript that i'm hoping to i'm working to get published um but mostly i, I as far as quantity i've written much more short stuff than i have novel length i did just complete writing a twenty-five thousand word novella just to see what the novella writing experience would be like could you know how do you that's a kind of halfway point of, of, of words for your buck, as Terry would say. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was an interesting experience and I'm hoping to have, I, 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 right now I don't have that limitation of the uh, well-published author like Terry, uh, where there's expectations of what the market wants from you. Uh, yeah, so I get to, I'm playing around and seeing what I like. Uh, and and I've had reactions to this story that is that I'd, in Fresh Start saying, what's, yeah, what's next? What else is there? Please tell me you're writing more. So now I've lined up a series of adventures for these two characters that I'm going to turn probably into a series of short stories. Um, yeah. So that's that's my plan for right now, plus trying to get my manuscript that's already out there. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to ask because this was a this was a common thing. I, I, I'm I'm a Canadian, and I, I as a study in Canadian literature, you have authors like Alice Munro whose books were not novels, but they were linked to short stories. So it sounds like that's a potential option for you, especially because the story seemed to have resonated, the characters resonated uh, with people. Yeah, and as somebody who's just starting out in this world of writing and publishing, uh, yeah, so this, right now it looks like I'm gonna be writing a series of short stories, but who who knows where this will, will go? That's a glorious thing about writing, especially if you have characters you get sucked into and you're, you're, you're attached to. Their adventures might be 3,000 words this time, 140,000 words next time. So we'll, Don't do that. we'll see where they go. <laughs> awesome. 
Uh, so uh, an another assist from from our friends uh, saying Bill May uh, was the uh, author, 78 years young, first story. Congratulations, Bill. How awesome. How awesome. Don't give up on that writing dream. Now, uh, guys, we have a question from uh, Buffy. Buffy asks a question, and I'd like you guys to all take turns answering this one is, how has the pandemic affected your writing? Has it slowed it down? Has it given you more time to work? Has it even changed your focus or style? Thank you for that question, Buffy. Uh, so um, who wants to have a stab at this first? Um, I, oh, go ahead, Terry. <laughs> okay. Um, I found that the effect of the pandemic was mostly on my brain. I, I wasn't able to concentrate as much. And so things felt like they were going slower. But when I looked at my word count, the novel took me about the same amount of time to finish as, as the other ones had. Uh, what I found that I couldn't do was have bad stuff happen. Yeah. There are no pandemics in my book. Right. Uh, this The one that I was writing right after that was um, <laughs> nobody from the IRS is listening. I took We took a 50th anniversary tour to the British Isles and we went first class. And it was fantastic. And I go, well, if I can crank out some quickie little romance short story or, or a quickie romance, I can write off some of this trip expense. And I couldn't write a short, cute romance. It had to be a mystery and there had to be other stuff going on. And I followed it along. But the pandemic is not mentioned. Uh, it turned in, into a travel novel, whether there's any more along that. I couldn't travel this last year. I had several trips planned. So yeah. I, you know, this book one is going to be book one for it's a week. backyard romance that you were writing. That's what it was. What? So you wrote a backyard romance this year. And you wrote <laughs> <everything> supplies. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I wrote another of my, my mystery books, but I, I just could he's, he's been hurt. He's been dealing with serial killers. I go, no, this is just a, a cozy police procedural is what I'm <laughs> I, I couldn't have this bad stuff happen. Yeah. Okay, Josh, <laughs> you had a you had an answer to that one as well. Yeah, I I did. Um, so I was gonna say, and I guess this ties into with what we were just talking about. Um, I originally had started out writing novels for the past ten years, and have written several, and always thought, oh, that's only thing as a writer I'm going to do. Um, and yes, a little few years ago, I had started dabbling with some short stories and realized I didn't know how to write a short story because it was everyone always asked, well, that's a nice first chapter. Where's the rest of it? I'm like, all <laughs> right, I need to figure these out a little more. Um, so I had started reading a lot more short fiction and um, getting into it. So where that comes in with the pandemic, um, at the beginning of it, I was, um, was trying to work on a novel and had got through about 30,000 words and then for some reason just hit a wall and could not focus on anything of substantial length at all. Um, so for all of last year, I think I wrote 15 or 16 different short stories. Um, wow. So they were just a lot easier to focus on and um, kind of a lot, just a lot of fun to play around with some different ideas. And I was, yeah, really enjoying it and um, provided that perfect escape with just the crazy year we all had and um so yeah that definitely still plan to continue writing novels and working on another one now but um i think the short fiction has definitely become something that's gonna stick around good stuff and and it's been a it's been a good omen right the short fiction Got picked up by Sauce right. Anthology. <laughs> That's right. Excellent. How about you, Bone? Well, um, I, I'm in a kind of a different situation than these two. I, I'm a parent. I have a third grade daughter. So when COVID hit, 
her school just shut down. The whole city shut down and they weren't really prepared for what, what to do. So it was up to the parents. So, so I became Professor Papa, leading Professor Papa's Enrichment Academy for my daughter <laughs> and creating curriculum and all this stuff. So my writing really would have just gone by the wayside, except that I was saved by my critique group. Um, the fact that we actually had uh, a structure that said you had to submit so much uh, every month really forced me to find time either after she was in bed or maybe when she was, you know, we would end school for her at her school day, like around one in the afternoon and she'd go play with her friends because nobody had a, a school bell to ring or anything or, or whatever. But so I ended up having to uh, push and pull the calendar a bit to find time. And I, I definitely was not as productive as either of these two. I think I got uh, through my novella and uh, maybe two short stories in the uh, in the last year. But uh, it, it's been it's been a fun balance of of playing quasi homeschool. Then you know when they were allowed to go back in person this January, how that works, and then oh no, now they have an outbreak at their school, so now we have to shift back to to teaching at home. And it's been very hard to be consistent in any way. But I, I, I give my props to my critique group for be, being there as oh, I, 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 it's like having a deadline. If you're a journalist, I got to get this in or something. I have to submit something. I don't want to be the one in the critique group who's like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't have anything this month. So, yeah, it was it's been very hard to have a consistent writing schedule. I have some other writers I follow online who are like, you know, I had a good day. I pumped out 5000 words today. I'm like. <laughs> it's not me. I can't do it. I don't like my calendar doesn't let it happen. Yeah. yeah, there is nothing like those uh imposed deadlines that can help you like getting those uh, little pieces in as, as you mm -hmm. can. So uh guys, thank you so much for sharing those insights. Um the book is available, it's available in print, it's available in ebook. Um popping yes. up uh books to read.com slash fresh starts, which will link you to pretty much any um retailer out there for uh ebook. And then uh, the print book is often tied to the ebook on many of the sites that sell both prints and ebooks. Well, they can probably order it through their favorite local independent bookstore, I imagine, just by uh, checking out the book. Yeah, they can. Yeah. Right. It's available through your local bookseller, Barnes and Noble, the great and powerful Amazon, whatever it is you want to use. Excellent. Well, guys, uh, thank you so much for taking the time with me today. Uh, thank you to the live audience for uh, asking questions and comments. Uh, I'm looking forward to digging into it. It sounds intriguing. Uh, the three stories that I've heard about uh, in depth today sound amazing. But what I love is this is cross genre. This is probably something for everyone in this anthology. And I'm picking my copy up on Kobo because I'm in Canada and that's the e-reader of my choice. Um, <laughs> but it looks like a gorgeous book that I might even have to own in paperback, hoping uh, you know we can all be in person someday again at, at Pike's Peak when it's not virtual uh, like this year and, and get some autographs on those. Guys, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Mary. Thanks for inviting us over. So there's three things I want to reflect on based on the conversations. Well, may maybe four, but I'll, I'll be really, really brief. The first is just the idea of a collaborative anthology with that many writers working together, uh, you know, volunteer organization, putting out the anthology, kind of to spotlight their members, but also opening it up to authors from around the world. And uh, what a great opportunity because, you know, these collaborative projects are how authors can prop one another up and promote one another because every single person who promotes a book like that um, gets exposure uh, for the other authors in the anthology, and that may lead to somebody going, "Oh, wow, I really like your short fiction. What else do they have?" So that's 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 the first thing. The second is I'm going to go to when Bowen talked about. So the story he had uh, used in this anthology, I was intrigued by the fact that, it, like, because he was discovering these characters, he kind of wrote about them, thought it was neat, fit the theme, and then based on how that story resonated with readers, he, uh, you know, like, "Hey, can we have more?" He, he's adapted the style. He's adapted. He's like, well, maybe I need to revisit these characters in uh, different situations. And that becomes a whole new writing project that probably wouldn't have happened uh, had he not participated in this anthology. So that's a huge bonus. You go over to Terry and uh, thinking about the story that she had originally written way back when, like 16 plus years ago, and then found 
that there was a home for it. And it also resonated enough that even though, you know, she's obviously a much better writer today than she was when she first wrote that story, it was still, it, it was solid, it worked, it resonated. Uh, not not in her wheelhouse, of course, it was outside of the stuff that she's been writing and being very successful on with her series books. But again, shows that she's had the long had the talent uh, and, and the story can resonate. So, you know, never throw anything away. I think that's a great uh, lesson for writers that you can potentially use that uh, somehow. And then uh, Joshua, similarly, he, his story was written just a little bit before, and it happened to uh, coincide with a the theme. But what I want to reflect upon with Joshua is, is the fact that you have a creative person who's doing multiple things. He has multiple talents. So he has talent as a writer, but he also has talent as an artist. And he's a dual contributor uh, contributor to this anthology. And and that's the other thing is uh, trying to, you know, open up your uh, mind to the different ways that you can participate, the different ways that you can collaborate, the different creative projects you can be involved in in different ways. It doesn't only have to be a story. And, and that's the other thing about this collection in general is it's it's articles, it's essays, it's poetry, it's stories. So the, the, the collection itself was very open-ended on the theme of fresh starts. And the very, very last reflection is just on those fresh starts. When you think about the theme of fresh starts, I've done uh, things where I've taken old stories, old ideas, I've, I've written uh, two different versions on the same theme or the same concept because I realized that I could I could try again, I could give it another shot, I could kind of approach it from a different angle or a different perspective. There's all kinds of things you can do with your writing with fresh starts. <clears throat> fresh did I say sharts? <laughs> no, I didn't mean to say sharts. I'll leave that in there. I normally cut out when I when I go things up. I'll just leave it in there just to give you a bit of a giggle. Fresh starts, not sharts. You don't want fresh sharts. Um, so anyways, uh, what I was going to say before I, I tripped on my tongue there, seems like I, I want to do tongue twisters, doesn't it? But what I was going to say was, what are some fresh starts that you've tried as a writer? Uh, feel free to leave those comments over on episode 186 of the Stark Reflections podcast at starkreflections.ca. I'll uh, read those in a future episode. But that is it for the Reflections. Uh, that is it for this episode. Thank you so much for joining me in this extra bonus episode of the podcast. So until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.